Hello! Today we are continuing with Atmospheric Science series and we are introducing new forces into the talk and these are frictional forces and viscous forces. Viscous forces are actually very complicated and uh, sometimes difficult to grasp so I decided before we uh, go into that direction to first cover frictional forces that are a little bit more intuitive and easier to understand. So. I split this talk in two to three videos, we'll see. Uh, in today's video, we will only talk about frictional forces and then in next one or two videos, we will cover viscous forces. What is the difference now, you might ask, between friction and viscosity? Well, friction arises when we have a contact or in particular some rubbing between solid objects, like this. Viscous forces arise when we have a liquid uh, or a gas, when we have fluids that are moving relative to each other or one fluid moving uh, relative to itself, so to speak, or if we have fluid that is in motion over some uh, solid surface, such for example, what is happening in this glass right now. This whiskey is moving relative to glass, so there are some viscous forces involved in this business. But before, as I said, we go into viscous forces, we will today cover frictional forces, which are a little, a little bit more easier to understand. And uh, uh, they arise due to uh, rubbing between two solid objects. Now, uh, frictional forces are in our everyday life. Pretty much all phenomena around us involve some uh, sort of frictional force. Walking, running, driving car up, down the hill, uh, flat on the flat surface, frictional forces, touching someone, frictional forces, me being able to sit on this chair, frictional forces, uh, this camera being mounted on the stand, frictional forces, uh, kissing, frictional forces, touching someone's hair, frictional forces, as you can see, many, many phenomena. However, frictional forces are at the same time quite complicated because uh, the expressions that we have are mostly empirical and they are empirical because the force depends on the two objects that are touching each other. So you can have pretty much infinite number of uh, different objects touching infinite number of other different objects and then there is always different friction between them. To demonstrate that in an example, of course, friction between rubber and glass is not the same as friction between concrete and glass. In fact, friction between smooth glass and concrete is not the same as friction between some rough glass and concrete. So you can go on and, and see how it, uh, how it gets more complicated. Now, let's go and qualitatively uh, describe uh, how the friction force works. I will have an object on, uh, that is sitting on the surface, let's say on the ground, and uh, this is my object a nice box. There is gravity acting down, mg, and because there are no accelerations in the vertical direction, and I will call this vertical direction z, this, there has to be opposite force that is the same as gravity, but in the opposite direction we call that normal force that is also equal mg. Now, I apply some force to this object. I start pushing this object in that direction with some force F. If I push it slightly, nothing will happen uh, in terms of uh, the, the object will not move because there is a friction force here close to the surface that is acting in the opposite direction and I will call that force F, F, force due to friction. If I uh, push a little bit harder, maybe it's still not gonna move this object. Which means, as you can see, that frictional force adjusts to my external force uh, that I'm using to push this object. However, at some point, I will push this too strong and I will move the object in this direction, which means I uh, exceeded the maximum amount of static friction and that maximum amount of static friction is equal to mu times n, where n is the normal force. This is a empirically derived expression for, for frictional force between two solid objects, and uh, 
as you can see, the expression is kind of very simple. It just involves one coefficient that is uh, dimensionless, as you can see. Uh, and we have two, times of, two types of these coefficients. We have static uh, uh, frictional coefficient, and that is the coefficient related uh, to the case when, I, when the object is still hold, uh, steady and I just start pushing it. And then there is kinematic uh, frictional coefficient, which is related to friction when this object is already moving. Static is a frictional coefficient is always larger than kinematic. And that's one of the reasons when you want to push the car, it's always the most difficult to start pushing it. Once, you, once the car is kind of uh, rolling down the road, it's easier to keep that uh, speed. This uh, coefficient of friction is uh, actually quite easy to uh, derive for two objects. Let's say I have inclined plane like this. And the angle of this inclination is alpha. And I have uh, a body on this plane. There are, as I said, there is a force of gravity acting down, mg. Now I will say that my vertical direction is perpendicular to this inclined plane, so this will be my z now. And now I decompose this force into two directions. I have this direction which would be mg cosine alpha, and I have uh, in the horizontal direction, and this would be mg sine alpha. Because it's on the inclined plane, this uh, horizontal component of uh, gravity will push it down, which means there will be friction force in the opposite direction, FF. Now I will write the second Newton's law in the x, that this, this will be my positive x. I write second Newton's law in the, posit in the x direction. What do I have? In this direction, I have my horizontal component of gravity mg sine alpha and in the opposite direction I have friction force minus f due to friction has to be zero. Has to be zero just slightly before this uh, object starts moving. So I am looking at the moment it started moving. <clears throat> okay, now I can uh, go ahead and uh, insert uh, my frictional force instead of f mg sine alpha minus frictional force is mu times n and n is this normal component of the force which is mg cosine alpha equals to zero. I can see that mg and mg cancels out and I get that this mu static, this is static uh, frictional coefficient is tangent of alpha. Clearly, there are two things that uh, we can uh, conclude from this expression. Thing number one, two very non-intuitive things, very, very non-intuitive things. Number one, the friction coefficient doesn't depend on the mass. Look, there is no mass, which means if this object is one kilogram or 200 kilograms, the friction coefficient will be the same. Right? Secondly, it also totally uh, not intuitive. It doesn't depend on the surface area, which means if this object was this big, the uh, static friction coefficient is the same. Completely non-intuitive things. So that's pretty much uh, what we can say about uh, the force of friction. And uh, to conclude uh, this video, Let's do a small experiment and try to determine this static friction coefficient for uh, some objects, everyday objects. And uh, one of the everyday objects that you should definitely have is this Bible, which is called uh, Feynman's Lectures on Physics. So here I have, uh, I took two books, Feynman's Lectures on Physics. So let's determine this static 
static friction coefficient between two Feynman's book rolling next to each other. To do so, uh, I need some platform so you can see, and it just happened I have here a very nice platform. So now you can see my experiments. I have two books here sitting on top of each other. Now you have to, as I said, the uh, frictional coefficient highly uh, the, coef the coefficient of friction highly depends on the material. So for example, one side of the book is maybe a little bit more rough than the other side of the book, although they are the same material, who knows. But what I will do here, I have a small ruler. I will incline this like this. Uh, and you can see at certain point this book starts sliding. So let's measure this inclination. So I'm increasing the angle, increasing the angle, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing yet, nothing yet. Oh, I would say somewhere here. So I need to measure this angle. This is very rough measurement. As you can see, I'm holding things with my arm. So this angle this is around 5.5 centimeters. So let's say it is 5 centimeters and this is 7.5 centimeters. So let's say it is 8. So what we have here is that that tangent alpha is uh, 5 over 8. This is approximately 5 over 8. And uh, what is 5 over 8? That should be 0 0.65, I believe. 625. 0 0.625. So, and that is equal mu s. We just calculated, very important, this is very important, guys. We calculated the static friction coefficient between two Richard Feynman lectures on physics books rolling relative to each other. Okay, now to conclude this video, I'll give you a small test. And the test is the following. Let's say I'm on top of the hill and I want to go down the hill as fast as I can. Then the fastest way to go down the hill would be this. Things that I do for science. This was so much fun that I actually repeated it one more time. Okay, now the main question comes. And I will ask you this question, the same question that Professor Stevan Genige asked me in the undergrad uh, exam on physics. If you are on top of this hill, but the hill is covered with uh, ice and you want to go down as fast as possible, would this method of rolling be the most efficient or not? What do you think? Let me know in the comment section below and uh, provide an explanation for your answer. What would be the most efficient way to go down this hill if the hill is covered in uh, ice? I hope you enjoyed today's video. I'll see you in the next video. Have an excellent rest of the day. Goodbye.